Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar series of AI in healthcare. So with this webinars, we are trying to uh, bring together the diverse skill set of clinicians and computer scientists. And uh, we are from Center for Eye Research Australia. Uh, this uh, webinar series is funded by Professor Meng He's uh, MRFF grant from the Commonwealth of Australia. And today we are here to learn about how AI can be used to help improve the image analysis in the detection of diseases such as prostate cancer and uh, emphysema. Um, and our speaker, uh, Dr. Ruan Tenekou, is uh, currently a lecturer in RMIT University in the um, Computing Technology School of Computing Technologies. Dr. Ruan has um, three patents and, and, uh, and more than 30 uh, peer-reviewed journals. He's very experienced in, in AI research and he has extensive uh, experience in collaboration with industry partners such as IBM, IBM Research and also uh, St. Vincent Hospital Melbourne. And I believe this, this the, in today's, the, most of the topic is in collaboration with uh, St. Vincent Hospital in Melbourne. While you, uh, we are all hearing the talk. Uh, feel free to type any questions in the chat box or in the Q&A. And also just know that uh, all this will be recorded for everyone to review later on on our YouTube channel. So stay tuned on our YouTube channel. Go ahead, everyone. Thanks, and for the nice introduction. And also thanks, uh, Ming, for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Uh, saying, can you enable uh, screen sharing? I think it's disabled. It says I can't uh, share the screen. Now I can do that. Awesome. And can you see my screen? Yes. All right. All good. Thank you uh, uh, for inviting me to uh, give this talk on the workshop series for AI. And today I'm going to share some of my experience on developing computer vision systems for uh, CT image analysis. Uh, I have been uh, working on CT image analysis for uh, quite some time now. I think I got, uh, got started on this area about 2011. And initially, this was before the deep learning has uh, you know, picked up. And initially, we were developing uh, traditional vision-based systems to do uh, you know, lung CT image analysis, uh, doing things like image registration for progress monitoring, and also uh, you know, uh, looking at 4D CT images and trying to figure out whether motions can uh, help us uh, define new biomarkers for things like cancer uh, you know, uh, diagnosis as well as you know, things in emphysema and so. Uh, you know, since uh, deep learning took off uh, back in 2012-14, uh, you know, uh, 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 time frame, uh, I've also, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, started researching in this area, and you know, I have done several works again on uh, CT image analysis as well as other types of uh, 3D image analysis like 3D OCT images and so. Now, the the projects that I'm going to talk about today are mainly some recent projects that we have worked on. Uh, I'm going to talk about two projects. The first one is on using AI for incidental detection of prostate cancer. Uh, and the second one is uh, on uh, quantifying emphysema using lung CTs uh, via a label efficient uh, machine learning algorithm. So let's get started. The first uh, uh, work, uh, as I said, is on uh, incidental detection of prostate cancer with CT scans. And this is a collaboration between RMIT and the St. Vincent's Hospital. This is a project that I'm really excited about, mainly because uh, you know, uh, this is a novel uh, problem. Uh, no one uh, before us has used AI to uh, detect prostate cancer on computer uh, tomography scans or CT scans. And also this is, this is a new problem that AI uh, can solve. And uh, you know, this is an area where AI can really assist uh, you know, healthcare systems in, in uh, you know, with, uh, managing different types of disease. This type of uh, solutions wouldn't exist without AI. All right, 
So before we uh, discuss the solution, let's see why incidental detection is very important in prostate cancer. Well, as we all know that prostate cancer affects a significant portion of our elderly population, it's considered the second most common type of cancer in men. Luckily, if detected at an early stage, uh, the survival rate of prostate cancer is quite high because the disease progresses slowly and therefore uh, early detection is a key in managing prostate cancer. However, generally prostate cancer does not show any symptoms until it becomes advanced. So therefore waiting till symptoms uh, occur can be too late. And therefore uh, things like screening programs and incidental detection tools are very important. So when we talk about incidental detection tools, we are talking about tool, tools or tests where you go and do the test for other reasons. And as a benefit or an added advantage of this test, you can diagnose uh, another disease like prostate cancer. All right. So let's first look at how prostate cancer is diagnosed. So traditionally, prostate cancer was diagnosed using a blood test called the PSA test uh, or digital rectal exams. Uh, no one likes to have a digital rectal exam. And then you know, these uh, examinations is usually followed by an ultrasound guided biopsy. So uh, biopsy is a sort of the gold standard in diagnosing prostate cancer. Uh, by the looks of it, this PSA test might look like a good screening tool because you know a blood test is easy to do, and also it is, uh, uh, it, you know, uh, there's not many uh, significant side effects of such a test. Therefore, it, it can be used as a screening program. Unfortunately, the accuracy of this test is highly contentious. Therefore, uh, countries like Australia and many other countries have decided not to run. Uh, screening programs based on the PSA test. So therefore, in these countries, it's very important to uh, develop incidental detection tools where we can uh, detect prostate cancer at an early stage. How about imaging modalities? Well, in terms of uh, imaging modalities, uh, multiparametric MRI is the most prominent imaging modality when it comes to uh, studying uh, prostate cancer mainly because there was a, 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 a protocol, uh, standardization protocol introduced uh, recently called PIRATS, and this allows the reading of uh, MRIs for prostate cancer be standardized. Uh, therefore, this is the go-to tool in terms of local staging for prostate cancer. Uh, how about CTs? Is CTs used for prostate cancer detection? Well, CT is used sometimes in the staging process of prostate cancer, mainly to see if the cancer has uh, grown out of the prostate gland and into the other regions, and also to check lymph nodes. However, generally prostate cancer is considered uh, not sufficient for humans to diagnose prostate cancer, mainly because of uh, the, the soft tissue contrast in uh, CTs are uh, low. Right? So this might indicate that our original thesis, which is to use AI to detect prostate cancer on CTs, is infeasible. Fortunately, there are some recent studies that have found a correlation between the findings on, uh, of, of uh, prostate cancer on MRIs and CTs. And these uh, studies provide uh, a uh, sort of a uh, confirmation of our high hypothesis and they provide us some indication that this, this uh, is a, a good avenue to, to follow. However, these studies are still rather limited. They are mostly uh, limited to small cohorts of patients and also most studies are uh, concentrated on small regions of the, uh, the prostate gland and does not look at the whole prostate. Therefore, further studies are required to uh, check the diagnostic capability of CT in terms of prostate cancer. However, we are not after developing a new diagnostic tool. What we are after is developing an AI system that can do incidental detection. When it comes to incidental detection, CTs make a lot of sense, mainly because CTs are widely available and also many uh, individuals who are in the high risk category for prostate cancer, mainly above 50 years of old, get CTs 
for many other reasons. And we, if we de develop a, a, a you know, detection-based uh, incidental detection system for uh, CTs, we can uh, you know, uh, utilize that for analyzing all those CT scans that are taken in our hospital. Such an uh, incidental detection scheme would uh, look something like this. Here you have a patient coming in for a CT uh, scan, a regu uh, regular CT scan, maybe because of a broken hip or some abdominal pain or something like that. So the CT gets uh, acquired and then a radiologist will analyze that CT for that particular reason. So if, if there's a broken hip, he, the radiologist will look at that particular reason on the image. In the meantime, we can also get this uh, CT to our AI system. And now the AI system can give some indication to the radiologist on whether there is signs of prostate cancer on that particular CT scan. And this allows the radiologist to make take appropriate action. Maybe he'd uh, do some follow-up investigations and uh, do a reporting on this. All right. In order to build this type of system, it's important that we answer a particular, uh, this particular question, which is, can clinically significant prostate cancer be detected on CTs using AI? So this is the question that we first wanted to answer. And in order to do that, we collected a retrospective data set from the St. Vincent's Hospital. So St. Vincent's Hospital has one of the largest uh, prostate uh, pre, uh, uh, cancer clinics. And from that, we collected a set of CT images. Uh, the set uh, consists of 571 patients. Out of this, 139 patients are diagnosed with clinically significant prostate cancer. This diagnosis is confirmed using biopsies. The remaining 432 patients are control patients who are males older than 50. And these patients were imaged at St. Vincent's Hospital for some other reason. And they have no prior history or suspicion of prostate cancer. All right, so this is the data set. Equipped with this data set, we developed a computer vision system. The vision system uh, pipeline uh, looks something like this. So we get the CT image, we extract the prostate region and then do some pre-processing on the uh, images uh, of the prostate region. And then we feed it to a 3D convolutional neural network. So convolutional neural networks are currently the state of the art when it comes to uh, image classification. And we uh, use uh, 3D convolution net neural network, which is capable of learning a classifier automatically uh, by looking at uh, examples from our data set. So this classifier, will tell us whether the scan, contain, uh, scan contains signs of prostate cancer or not, all right? So you may already know that CNNs are very data hungry. Usually we need thousands of images in order to train a robust model uh, to do a, a complex task like the one that we have. Unfortunately, we don't have that many data and it's pretty challenging to get even this uh, much of uh, CT data. Uh, so what can we do? We have to use some uh, techniques to uh, that, that can handle low volumes of supervised uh, label data uh, in developing these systems. So there are a couple of things in the uh, AI toolbox that we can employ for such situations. One thing is transfer learning. In transfer learning, we take a network that is already trained on the similar task and then we transfer that knowledge into our model and use that uh, to do our task. Again, this was not applicable for us. We didn't have a, uh, a model that was trained on a similar task. Therefore, we resort to something called self-supervised learning. And in self-supervised learning, what we do is, again, we leverage unlabeled data and we use that unlabeled data to learn a good representation, a model, and that model's information can be transferred to, uh, uh, to our task. For example, let's take an example. Let's say that we want to build a cats versus dog classifier. So we want to differentiate between images of cats versus dogs. Right now, uh, assume that we don't have thousands of images. Maybe we have a few hundred images to do this task. Now, what can we do? 
Well, we can go to the uh, go to a large database. Maybe there are a large data set of images. These images are not labeled. So there are uh, several images of animals, maybe not labeled. What we can do is we can do create some artificial labels, right? So these artificial labels, maybe you know, uh, we take the image in its original orientation and say that this is uh, and uh, this is belongs to class zero. And then we rotate that image and we say that this belongs to class one, right? Now we have a data set with some labels. These labels, no one needs to uh, generate them. There's no effort. We can write a script that generate these labels automatically. Now we can train a model and transfer that knowledge to our cats versus dog uh, classifi classifier and train this with few labels to do the task. Why would such a system work? Well, we know that when we have, uh, the, when, in order to know the correct orientation of the images, we need to know or understand the image itself. We need to know that oh, this dog uh, is in, you know, in, not in the correct orientation, it's, it's rotated. It means that we need to know that there's a dog, that, you know, this dog has to be in this particular orientation. So this type of things can be helpful when we develop uh, systems with limited supervision, all right? However, this uh, rotation uh, type of uh, uh, labeling does not work for medical imaging. For medical imaging, we had to use some other things. We, what we used is called patch swapping. So in patch swapping, what we do is we take CT images and we randomly uh, corrupt some patches on that CT image, right? So once we corrupt these patches, what we ask the network to do is we asked to the network to uh, reconstruct the correct version of the image. So when when the net again, it's easy to generate this data because we don't have to do anything. We get the CT images. We write a script to corrupt the data, uh, randomly uh, select some patches and corrupt that, and then we uh, you know ask it to create the original image. Right? Why would this work? No, if you can recall when we did English language test, there was always this. Uh, uh, you know, we were given sentences and we were asked to fill in blanks, right? This is something like that. In order to fill in blanks in an English sentence, we need to understand that the context of that sentence, and also we need to understand English grammar, right? We have to have a good knowledge. So this is, this is similar. So in, in order to fill in the, the, the corrupted places, the network needs to understand uh, these, these images, what type of organs, what, uh, what type of structures are there, and so on. Once we train a good representation uh, like this, what we can do is now we can take our uh, few labeled examples and use that to uh, train our model, which is our classification model. So what we did was we trained uh, 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 the prostate cancer classifier using this technology, and let's see how that performed. In order to uh, check the performance, what we did was we used five-fold cross-validation on our data set. We used a performance metric of AUC, uh, area under the ROC curve. And AUC is a measure where if, if your classifier is really good, it will give you one. And if your classifier is bad and uh, random, it will give a value around 0.5, right? You can see that when we train our network only using uh, you know, supervised learning, we get around 82% AUC, which is a reasonable value. But we can see that when we in, uh, incorporate self-supervised learning, we get a performance boost and we can build a classifier uh, that is around, uh, that has around 87% uh, AUC. Now this looks like a good performance, but we really want to put this into context and see how this system compares with other systems. Mainly we wanted to see how this will compare with radiologists doing the same task and also how this will compare to the MRI-based systems, because MRI is currently the, the, the standard when it comes to uh, imaging for a prostate cancer diagnosis. All right, so this is uh, what we did next. So here, what I have done is I have plotted our performance of our model as a ROC curve here in orange color. Now, any point below this curve is going to have uh, lower performance than our model, any point above this curve is going to have higher performance than our model. 
So in order to uh, test how humans would do on this task, what we did was we extract a subset of our original large data set, and we gave this data to two radiologists at St. Vincent's Hospital. So when we, uh, and th these radiologists read the uh, images and uh, provided us with the, what they think, whether they, this scan has uh, prostate cancer or not, right? So we plotted that result on this plot. So you can see uh, radiologist one here in green star and the radiologist two here in uh, purple color star. We can see that there's a large variation between uh, humans uh, or radiologists reading this. And we can clearly see that our system performs significantly better than uh, humans performing this task. Why would this be? Well, uh, one reason might be that the AI system is capable of leveraging some uh, subtle information that is not the, the, that human eye is not sensitive to, right? So this might be uh, a case and this supported by a literature as well. Uh, you know, uh, most uh, uh, radiologists currently do not read uh, pro, uh, CT images for prostate cancer, uh, all right? So the next thing is we wanted to also compare with MRIs. To do this, we use two systems. First one is the PIRAT system, which is radiologist reading uh, CTs using the PIRAT protocol. And the second one is MRI, uh, uh, AI system that takes in uh, MRI images as inputs. So these two uh, are shown here in red and blue color. Now we can see that this is almost on top of our ROC curve, meaning that this is uh, these results are very comparable uh, to what we have achieved. So this is good news. So this indicates that our uh, sort of uh, results uh, or our system is good enough for incidental detection of prostate cancer. All right. So for, for now, what we have done is we have developed a, a tool that can be used full, or we have uh, sort of developed a proof of concept that shows that uh, we can do incidental detection of prostate cancer on CTs. The next step is to do a prospective study where we uh, see the clinical implications of this type of tools. So that is the main next step in terms of what where we want to go. And uh, uh, if, if th that is successful, we would like to deploy this type of systems around the hospitals in Victoria. The next thing also in terms of te uh, technical side of things, we would also, uh, we are currently looking into uh, generalizability or adaptability of these models to different settings like different hospitals and so on. And also we are looking into improving the interpretability of these models. All right, so this is mainly the first project that I would like to talk about. The second project is more of a, a technological contribution from our side. And here what we are trying to do is we are trying to learn complicated or uh, complicated models that provide a lot of information by using very coarse or simple labeled examples. Uh, in order to, uh, as a case study for this uh, algorithm uh, that we develop, what we do is we use emphysema detection on CT uh, and demonstrate the capabilities on that. All right. All right, so let's look at the problem again. So this problem in, in medical imaging, often it's not enough just to say this particular image has emphysema and this particular image does not have emphysema, right? Or this particular image has cancer, this particular image has not, does not have cancer. That's not uh, adequate. Usually we need more information, like if there is emphysema, where should we look? I know where, where emphysema is concentrated or where is it and localize these things. And also we, you know, think in things like emphysema, we would like to know uh, what is the extent of emphysema? Is this a case of mild emphysema? Is this a case of severe emphysema? Or is it, is it somewhere in between? All right. So these are the things that we would like to do. And how can we get this uh, build models for doing all these tasks uh, together? Well, one thing we can do is we can get a database, get a lot of radiologists, and ask them to give, provide us detailed annotations. So ask them to give, give me uh, emphysema or no emphysema label, 
also give me the location of emphysema. This is segmentation and also give me the extent of emphysema. We can ask, to, uh, ask a radiologist to give all this. Again, this is possible, but this is going to be expensive because radiologists are not cheap and also it's, you know, th their time is valuable. So we don't want to, them to do a lot of labeling. On the other hand, if we go to any hospital database, there's going to be a lot of images. However, these images might have the diagnostic. These images will say that, oh, this is a prostate cancer patient. This is not a prostate cancer patient. Again, also it might say this is emphysema uh, scan. This is not emphysema and so on. This will have that coarse labels. However, this would not have that detailed labels that we are looking after. It wouldn't have, uh, you know, uh, this uh, segmentation type of information where it shows where the emphysema is. It doesn't have this uh, extent type type information as well. So the question is, can we build a model using that course labels that will help us to extract additional information? So there is a uh, area in machine learning that looks into this type of problems. It's called weekly supervised learning, right? So in weekly supervised learning, there is a special uh, uh, area called multiple instance learning. And this is what we leverage uh, for our work, all right? In multiple instance learning, what do we do? We take an image, right? Let's say a 3D CT scan. We break it down to small patches, right? These can be 3D cubes, uh, you know, 2D, if it is 2D, it can be rectangles. And now each of this patch is represented as an instance, right? So this is an instance and all the patches belonging to one image is called a back. All right, so now we have a bag of instances. So if the image is positive, we know that that bag is positive. If the image is negative, we know that that bag is negative. So that's the labels we have. Now, we want to build classifiers without uh, uh, doing additional labeling, just using this bag level uh, uh, sort of uh, labels. All right, so in order to do this, let's see what else we know about these bags now. So for example, if it is a negative bag, in negative, I mean uh, a healthy patient without emphysema in the emphysema example. So if, if a, a bag is negative, we know that all the instances should also be healthy or negative, right? Because if there is a healthy patient, there's no emphysema. So all these patches should be free of emphysema that we know. Second, we also know that if a bag is positive, uh, this patient is emphysema, uh, has emphysema, then at least one of these patches should have uh, uh, emphysema. That means at least one of these patches should be positive, right? This is the only information we know at the moment. And this, uh, this, this uh, sort of assumption is called the multiple instance learning assumption or uh, mill assumption, all right? And you know, of course, how can we develop a system with uh, this type of labels? Again, we didn't uh, label anything. We just crop the patches and cropping the patches is easy. We can write a uh, uh, software script that easily does that, all right? As an alternative, if we really have the effort, what we can do is we can get all these patches labeled, right? We can employ a radiologist, we can ask him to label patches. Again, the negative ones, we don't need any labels. We know that all the instances are also negative. For the positives, we can ask him to look at this region and say, ah, oh, this region does not have emphysema. This is a negative instance. This region has emphysema. Therefore, this is a positive instance and so, right? So this, this can be done, but this is the thing that we want to avoid. We want to work with labels like this. No instance labels, only back level labels. All right, so let's, see how this is done. Well, actually we can train a, a classifier using only that bag level labels or that multiple instance learning assumption. So here as an example, I am showing the classifier uh, as a linear classifier to th make things simple. But in our uh, 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 models that we develop, we are using deep neural networks to do the classification. So they are going to be non-linear classifier. So how would this work? We know that uh, if a bag is 
negative, then it has to be on this side of the line, meaning that this is the negative negative side, all right? And if a bag is positive, at least one instance should be on this side of the line, right? That's the positive side of the uh, classifier. So we are separating uh, positives from negatives. Now you can see that actually we can learn a classifier using the mill assumption, multiple instance learning assumption, and it will do well on the bag levels. So bag levels means our output is also still, uh, this image has emphysema, this image does not have emphysema, all right? That will do well. We can train a, a, a technique with, ex, a model with existing technique. However, can we use this to get localization or get instance level labels? So can we use this to do instance level labels? Well, in order to find, figure that out, what we can do is we can do that thing we don't want to do, we can uh, uh, get instance level labels, we can train a classifier, I'll call this super S instance classifier. So this is where a radiologist uh, labeled every single patch. And now we have a classifier, we can see that these two classifiers does not agree in some regions, right? Here we can see that in this region, the classifier, the mill classifier makes some mistakes. And this shows that, you know, if we try to localize things using a mill classifier, it really doesn't work effectively. You know, we are going to say, uh, identify few patches with emphysema, but we are not going to give the complete story to the radiologist, which means that it, it's not going to be that useful in terms of localization. And also it's not going to uh, do very well in terms of uh, uh, extent of emphysema. How can we improve that? This is where our technical contribution comes in. What we did was we identified a way to uh, sort of model our negative bags or negative instances. And what we can see is that once we model these negative bags, we know that anything outside this negative bag should be a negative sort of uh, distribution, negative uh, region should be a positive instance. So now that we can use that technology thing uh, effectively in a, a ML framework to learn another classifier. So this classifier, we call this EVT classifier. And this classifier, you can see that it learns something that is very close to the supervised learned classifier, right? So here again, we, we showed that the correct way to, or the, the way uh, we can model this uh, probability distribution of the negative samples is uh, through using something called extreme value theory. We showed that how this thing can be uh, combined with the expectation maximization framework to derive a uh, good classifier, all right? So let's look at how the results of this look like. So again, uh, we, we uh, tested our hypothesis or our models on uh, lung CT images from the Danish lung screening, uh, lung cancer screening tri trials. And we used that to uh, establish with how good our models is. And this work was published in IEEE Transaction on Medical Imaging in 2019. All right, so this uh, classifier, which is only le uh, you know, learned through using uh, classification labels, we know that you know, emphysema or not emphysema, it actually also can do localization. So if I go here, you can see that this is a lung of a patient that has a sort of medium level emphysema. And you can see that you know, red regions in this lung is where the emphysema is concentrated around. So you can see emphysema is concentrated around here, here, and these blue regions is where it's healthy, right? So this is a sort of a moderate emphysema patient. And if you look at this image, this is a, 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 a you know, sort of a, a distribution on a very severe emphysema patient. You can see that, you know, almost most of the regions of the lung has uh, got this, uh, you know, so, uh, red color, meaning that there's a lot of emphasis. All right, and this is the localization part. Now we can, with, with class labels, we can also derive where the emphysema is or localization without any segmentation labels, All right? The second thing is that emphysema is also graded according to a grade from one to five. So we can also uh, look at 
uh, you know, that, and we can see that there is a good correlation with the findings from our model with the grading. So again, without any uh, sort of severity level labels, we can learn classifiers that can give us that type of information as well. All right, so uh, this technique itself is fairly general. It's not uh, uh, specific to uh, lung CT images. In order to show that this is fairly general, we tested it on several other data sets as well. We use a 3D retinal OCT image classification data set where we were trying to classify uh, different types of fluids in OCT images. Again, we can see that our model can res uh, give results that is very, uh, very close to a supervised classified method. Right? So this full sup is a fully supervised instance level classifier and our EVT mill is also achieving uh, similar results in most of the tasks in terms of this. We also uh, tested our model on 2D histopathology images, mainly because these are different types of images, not 3D. Again, we show, you know, this is the image that is the input to our system. And again, we showed this image to our model as well as uh, the uh, expert uh, a doctor who reads these images and both comes with the correct classification. This is a colon cancer image. So it says, all right, this is colon cancer. And the expert says that he thinks that this is colon cancer because of these regions. Right? This is the regions that he's interested in. That's where the colon cancer is. Now, this is what our system outputs. We can see that our system also agrees with this uh, the, the expert's opinion. And it says that this is where the system thinks is, is sort of cancerous region, all right? So this is another image and it sort of also follows this uh, same idea. All right, so that is mainly what I uh, wanted to share with you all. Again, before I finish, I just wanted to highlight that I am part of the AI Innovation Lab at RMIT, which was established recently. And we do research in terms of six different themes, robotics, optimization, autonomous systems, uh, computer vision, augmented reality, and machine learning. Uh, where I fit in is in this computer uh, vision. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Rowan. It's absolutely fan fantastic. We are particularly interested in uh, seeing uh, OCT image there, but Thank we'll you. talk about other questions first. Um, the first question is from Devil Meta. Um, Devil is asking that what type of, uh, what which type of noise pattern or, or, or procedure that you use to correct those patches um, that you mentioned in your first part of your talk um, in, no, in order to um, confuse the CT image um, because it looks like those CTs are 3D images. Yes, so the, the CTs uh, themselves are uh, 3D. So the patches are basically uh, sort of uh, cubes. So it, it, it uh, you know, height and width, and also it has the uh, uh, several slices across the set dimension. Actually, so these are cube, uh, and these are usually randomly uh, distributed, uniformly distributed across the lung region. And these are overlapping patches as well. Right. Thank you. The second question is from Katarina. Katarina asking uh, also a question for your uh, image analysis for prostate cancer. In terms of your clinical trial, um, do you have a plan to externally validate the, uh, the algorithm? Um, because um, the question comes from, uh, um, there might be something that's particular to the cohort in St. Vincent Hospital that may be specific to that cohort, uh, which is making it less likely to generalize. Yes, so uh, th this is something that we are already started working on. So we have collected uh, data from two other hospitals and now we are validating our models uh, on those things. One uh, coming from New Zealand, an institute in New Zealand, and the other one, uh, another hospital in Melbourne. So we've already started this work. We are still waiting for some ethical clearance and once that is done, we, that is our priority. And that's a good question, yes. Uh, uh, we did have this initial uh, thing. So even in the St. Vincent's data set, we 
looked at different machines. So there are a couple of machines that send winds and views. So we uh, looked at the performance across these different machines. And it seems that at the moment, uh, they are generalizing well. Very good. Um, I have a question in terms of like CT is not good um, for soft tissue imaging. Can we say this notion is only true for human eyes, but less likely for uh, machine learning? It looks like yes. machine learning did a pretty good job in comparison to the MRI. Yes, exactly. This is uh, surprising to us as well. So it, it, it compares very well with MRIs. Again, yeah. this comparison is not a direct comparison because we are not using the same data set, right? So we, you know, that, that's part of, of what we hope to do in a clinical trial as well. We want to sort of look at the same cohort and you know, compare this you know, apples versus apples. At the moment, these are uh, you know, different cohorts. So you know, we shouldn't look too much into it. And again, this is not intended as a diagnostic tool. We don't want to advertise this as a diagnostic tool. Diagnostics, yes, MRI is the go-to tool, right? This is more of an incidental detection tool because mainly incidental detection on CTs work well because there's a lot of CTs. In it, St. Vincent's, there's going to be, you know, uh, you know, few, uh, you know, uh, 20 to 50 CTs done on a particular day on that high-risk category patient. So this, this applies to a wider range. So that, that's why we wanted to do on CTs. Again, a good question. Maybe uh, AI is uh, picking up things that are not sensitive to the human eye. That, that's the, the explanation that we've sort of come up up to now. But you know that's that's the thing that we want to investigate further as well with looking at different uh, you know uh, data sets from different machines and things like that in order to validate. So this this project is still at at a very early stage. We are, have a lot of things to do in order to validate this clinically and put this into practice. Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, it appears that AI um, can see so many things that. Uh, may or may not be obvious to humans. Like um, in, in our experience, uh, we use AI to just look at the retina. Um, mm -hmm. The AI can even tell the gender uh, uh -huh. of the, from just from the photo or uh -huh. whether the patient have a history of smoking, uh, whether it's a smoker or not. So it's uh -huh. absolutely, it sounds like it's, we're only scratching the surface. At exactly. The yeah, this, 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 this type of things fascinates me, you know. In a way, you know, you know this particular application. The, the main reason that I was so excited about this is that it seems that, you know, looking at the performance of radiologists on this data, it seems that, you know, without AI, we wouldn't have been able to deliver this type of application, right, to this task. And, you know, this is where AI can really help. So, Juan, can I have one question? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, so, so, first of all, congratulations. This is all wonderful work. Uh, I think it's fantastic. I mean, by showing just based on very small sample size and also even, um, I mean, uh, with small sample size, you demonstrate uh, the way that you can improve the, uh, 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 the accuracy by unsupervised learning and also your ideas on uh, this Patrick and also the, the second part of your work, very interesting. But going back to the slide you're showing us, so I think... Uh, the radiologist won't be happy to see this <laughs> because <laughs> because you show that AI is better than their performance. I mean, for uh, in particular for this three, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, sp sp specialists. So in my in my understanding, so can would would that be helpful? That you just try to clarify what's clinically why this uh, why this radiologist have this lower or poor compromise sensitivity in terms of why they have false negative, why they miss the true case, and why they have a false positive. Is it when they, in the context of why they miss the true case, a prostate cancer, is it because the lesion too small? Or I mean, you would, because we talk about cubic scan, right? Or cubic scan or 3D scan. Is it too small to miss? I mean, that's why they miss it or, and then why they come up with a false positive also. And then also it would be helpful to describe a little bit in the A for the AI, why the AI, come up with like a false negative and false positive. What's the clinical features of this false positive and, 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 and easy I mean, that would be quite interesting and help convince uh, I mean, the radiologists and all other specialists why this body AI can be more accurate than a human. I mean, we're a trained specialist. 
Yes, exactly. So, you know, the, the radiologists actually, they, they are not uh, sort of uh, worried about the performance here. It's, they were really excited to do this, uh, do this for us. And, you know, they were part of the project team as well, uh, these radiologists that uh, ca carried out this task. Uh, mainly the, the, in CTs, uh, you know, CTs have been around for a while and people have worked out that prostate cancer cannot be seen uh, effectively. So this is something that is already known and well documented in literature that radiologists wouldn't be doing very well on this task. What is surprising is that AI actually did this very well. And this is, I think, you know, as Ming says, in order to sort of build trust around this type of systems, we need to come up with better explanations. So we can at the moment give explanations like, oh, this is where the AI system is looking at. But in terms of prostate cancer, we have to look at things like uh, other features, which we are sort of uh, really don't have a good explanation about. For example, when there is tumors and when, they, when there's post false prostate cancer detections, the prostate is usually enlarged, right? It's not about, you know, uh, location. It's more about an enlargement of the prostate cancer. So that type of things can lead to false positives in radiology. The prostate in, enlarged, but this is not cancer. This is, uh, you know, uh, uh, benign uh, sort of things. Uh, and these kind of things, this is where we are currently working on how to build explanations. The explanation doesn't, you know, we, with AI, we can sort of give explanations that localize things. You know, this is what the network is looking at, this region, right? But the explanations in prostate cancer has to go beyond that. We have to see other features and say that, oh, how important is the enlargement of prostate to this model. And th these are the things that we are working on and we don't have a good solution at the moment. Yeah, fantastic, right? Because at, at, the, at the moment I can see that, uh, that in terms of the number of audience it's not, not so many for this mm -hmm. particular section, but then we'll put it in the YouTube. For the next round of the workshop and webinar, probably we'll put uh, like a very debate, uh, uh, like a debate uh, uh, a scenario where we have a, <laughs> we have a specialist, uh, they said specialist is better than the AI. And then we have an AI expert saying like AI is better than the specialist. And then, see, we, <laughs> then, then people can raise the different level of like the different evidence and see the, the, these kind of things may be more interesting for the audience. And, and also, um, so I just would like to say thank you very much. I mean, this is a great talk. I, I learned a lot. I enjoy uh, your presentation a lot as well. Thanks, Ming. I guess that goes to um, just to reinforce that the CT is not very good for soft tissue, but probably only for special uh, for human eyes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, same. Um, yes, uh, another question is from Romy also, who also thank you for your talk and congratulate on, on your talk. Um, he asked that if AI is successful in detecting prostate cancer on CT, how can this be used in the clinic? Um, what kind of CT do you think will be useful? Um, do you specify um, like certain age range or all men's CT can be used? And, and what would be the running cost for this? technology? Yes. So in terms of running cost, I can't give you any uh, suggestion. But in terms of uh, building such a system, what we really need is a, a GPU-based machine. So as long as we have this, and also we have a good interface to the, uh, the clinical uh, databases of, of a hospital, we can uh, you know, deliver such a system, right? So you know, we can build it either on the cloud, we can build it based on a GPU uh, computer so that I wouldn't say that this would add significantly more cost to hospital. Uh, what was the first part of the question? Uh, uh, so what kind of CT do you think will, will be will, we can use to feed into the algorithm? Uh, okay, yeah. Um, is that so, all, all, all ages or a certain age range? Uh, at the moment, uh, what we did was we only uh, took uh, CTs for patient, uh, patients or individuals that are 50 years or above. So we selected that because that's the prostate cancer risk category. Uh, we didn't look at the younger patients. Uh, another thing is that we were looking only at uh, contrast enhanced CTs. We have a plan to uh, look at uh, non-contrast or low contrast CTs in the future as well. At the moment, this study was limited to contrast enhanced CT. Yeah. Is the upper limit of the age? Because I understand uh, 
uh, above certain age, if we go through biopsy, for example, more than half of a man will have positive diagnosis of prostate cancer, right? Above yeah. 70 something or 80 something. Yeah. Yes, uh, we, we put the statistics on age uh, on, on the paper. If I can remember, the average age was around 67 uh, or something like that. Or, you know, we matched the ages between both cohorts, uh, positive and negative. Uh, and that was mainly uh, uh, you know, dictated by the positive cohort because you know, prostate cancer patients are mostly uh, you know, older patients around 60s. So the average age was around 60 for these both cohorts. 60-something. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think um, we have answered all the questions so far in, in the audience. And uh, we thank you again and congratulate all your work. We're looking forward to hearing the result from your clinical trial. Maybe, yeah, we can see more results coming out in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.